Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, good to see you. nice full packed room. That's always good to always good to have that. It's never good when two people show up. Um, I've given this talk before. This is a slight variation of the one that I gave it besides Seattle. Was anyone up in Seattle and saw this talk there? Oh, good. So it's new for everyone. Great. So talk about hmm. is that working um, so what are we gonna do in the next 45 minutes well I'll start with a quick overview and talk about application behavior um, unexpected behaviors in applications and where, where you might find those and what they might be coming from why it happens and how do you know it's happening in your own applications? And then a quick wrap up. Um, just real quickly, quick show of hands. How many people would say that part of your job is responsible, you're responsible for either developing or shipping secure applications? Okay, good. How many people are responsible for breaking applications? <laughs> About 50-50. Some people raise their hand for both. <laughs> breaking applications and delivering secure applications. Awesome. Okay. So a quick, um, a quick info about me. Um, I'm co-founder and CTO of Deep Factor. We have a booth right outside. Um, in a nutshell, we make software that helps developers fix and find vulnerabilities and prioritize them in the correct order. Um, what should be fixed first, second, third, fourth, uh, based on uh, various, various factors. Um, I'm also an adjunct faculty at San Jose State University in California. I've been teaching there for a long time. Um, I always joke with my students that the first student I get that says, my mom or my dad took your class, then it's time to go. <laughs> Fortunately, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm at 22 years there, so it'll be happening pretty soon, I think. Um, I teach in the computer engineering uh, master's degree program, uh, software engineering degree, teach virtualization technologies, software security, and sometimes the operating systems course, some fairly low level stuff. I'm an active open source contributor. I've been working primarily with OpenBSD since 2008. I wrote the hypervisor there, some device drivers, power management, and whatnot. So in this session, I'm going to show some things that we've seen applications doing. When I say we, I'm talking about specifically about our product. Our product monitors application behavior, and some of the things we've seen over the years are, are, are pretty crazy. And I put together a list over the years, kind of jotted some things down where I said, this is, this is weird and strange behavior, and that's what I'm going to share with you guys today. Um, some of these things that you'll see are very questionable security-wise. Some of them are questionable performance-wise, and some are just plain head-scratchers. Like, why is the application doing this? Um, I'll talk about how we found these things. It's really no secret. Um, and I'll talk about uh, how these things possibly can happen and how you can fix these things in your own environment. Sound good? Awesome. So you can learn a lot about how an application is constructed and built based on monitoring what it does. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how you mechanically do the monitoring. Um, but if you watch what an application does, like what API calls it makes, what system calls it uses, what library calls it uses, you can get some pretty interesting insights as to what applications do. You can also see things that, I wouldn't call them hidden behaviors, but it's the point of this talk is to talk about things that you might not know are going on. So, uh, what API calls are used again, uh, what parameters are passed, what files are opened and closed, and, and whatnot. Many times uh, these, these uh, behaviors were coded into the application by the developer. In other words, it's what the developer wanted. So for example, they, did they really write code to open that file or make that network connection and so on? Or uh, sometimes it, th these behaviors are introduced by third-party dependencies. Um, how many people have heard that quote in that second bullet item? <laughs> hey, I found a library on GitHub. Seems to do what I want to do. I'm just going to use it. <laughs> OK, show of hands. How many people have done that? All right, good. In Seattle, nobody raised their hand. I said, so I've got a room full of liars. <laughs> right. So of course, stands to reason that if you import somebody else's code, their behaviors in, that are coded into their library or dependency now they're your behaviors, right? So what could some of these things possibly do? Well, that's what we'll talk about today. The moral of the story and kind of one of the important things I want to leave you with as you leave the talk is that most of the time developers don't know that this is happening, right? They import something, who's going to go through and vet thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code? So now all of a sudden, an application has introduced behavior or a dependency has introduced uh, behavior into the application that the developer just flat out doesn't even know that's going on. 
Okay, unexpected behaviors. Logic that you coded or your team coded is what you expect to happen when your program is executed, obviously. But there are many things that happen without you knowing. What are some of those things? Anytime you leave your own self-coded control flow paths, all bets are off. And that's not really a Vegas, uh, <laughs> it's not really a Vegas call out, but technically that's true, all bets are off. Um, so let's look at a quick example. This is the dumbest program ever. Can anybody make a dumber program? Maybe, I don't know. But this is pretty stupid, right? What does this do? Well, it's a bash script that prints hello. It clearly does no file manipulation. I mean, per perhaps writing to standard out or something like that. It doesn't use the network. It doesn't manipulate environment variables. It does nothing, absolutely nothing whatsoever. So, show of hands. How many files get opened by the operating system? Let's just assume it's Linux for the moment. How many files get opened when you execute that script? Anyone want to take a guess? Could be easily a dozen. Okay, well here, is it more than five? How many people say more than five? How many people say less than five? <laughs> How many say more than 50? <laughs> Now think about everything that could get opened, right? All I'm doing is running bash and saying echo hello. <laughs> what was that? More than 100? Well, one of the answers I always like to use with my students is my favorite answer in the world is it depends. <laughs> it depends based on your environment and how it's configured, but it's quite, it's, it's more than you think. What things get opened when you run bash <laughs> echo hello? Well, the, the, what does the operating system do? Assuming you're running it from another shell, what happens? Process forks, process execs, the new bash. So when you do a new exec, when you do an exec, what happens? The shared library loader, ld.so gets invoked, looks at the header of the executable to figure out what things need to be brought into memory. So that's at least the executable itself, plus any libraries. Let's just assume for the moment that it's just libc. What happens when libc gets initialized? Well, it looks at all kinds of other stuff, right? So the fact that you're just, the fact that you just have two lines of code should not be an indication that this is a simple operation. Actually, quite a few things get open. We'll look at it in, in a moment. The more important thing is how was this application built? And I'm using Bash as an example here. What compiled feature? What, what features were compiled in or linked in? Does your distribution vendor that gave you Bash link in all the things? Um, they did a blog post on the uh, XZ um, issue from a couple months ago and looked at what was linked into uh, various system programs. And it's interesting that uh, SSHD, the SSH server, uh, on, different, on different distributions had between five dependencies or dependent libraries and 47. So if you have different things linked into your executable, different things will happen, right? So strive for thinness. If, you're, if your distribution vendor is not linking in all the things, your behavior will be, there'll be fewer unknown behaviors. Do you have environment variables set that might guide Bash, in this case, to behave in different ways? There's many different environment variables that you can set that Bash will look at and do different things based on what you've got these things set to, perhaps opening different files or whatnot. So things like this are, the, are the re, what can result in potentially a lot of things happening in your application that you probably don't know about. Okay, speaking of environment variables. How many environment variables do you think are read by the system or any process when bash is executed? It depends. It depends. <laughs> How many are changed? It depends. Now, we're going to actually look at it in a moment. Again, the answer is it depends based on how your environment was configured. Um, the more options you have linked in, the more things are going to be looked at. Building software with every possible thing linked in as features is very risky. Case in point, what I just talked about. If distribution vendors that choose to link in every possible thing into their environment and you end up with, well, you end up with the kitchen sink. For, just for fun on your own machine sometime, Go run LDD against some of the system services that are running. What you want to see is a really short little list. You don't want to see the universe. 
Like, for example, why do, why does why do the audio APIs need to be linked into SSH, right? Doesn't make any sense because it's a dependency of a dependency of a dependency and something needed it. So we've already talked about this, but process behavior is, is affected by the environment in which it runs. So for example, uh, you might have LD underscore option set, LD audit, LD preload to, to, in, to influence the, the LD.so to do different things when the application is started. But uh, uh, yeah, I think we've talked about most of that already. So let's go back to Bash for a second. So, just a second. Can you guys see that? I just want to make sure that I'm okay. Good. All right. Um, so this is just a WSL VM that's running on this machine. Um, it's the Ubuntu 22. Um, if I just do Bash dash C echo hello. It's fundamentally the same thing as what you just saw. So anybody have an idea how we can determine which files are opened? Because that was the question, right? What files are opened when I run that? Anyone have an idea? S trace, perfect example. There's lots of different ways. S trace is super easy for the purpose of, of today's demonstration. So we can do S trace bash dash C echo hello. Yeah, I'll come back to that. <laughs> Okay, so it shows you all the things that happen, right? And we can do some quick prepping for opens and whatnot, and you get, oops, actually have to do slightly differently here. Okay. Let's look for open in temp log. So it opens a bunch of stuff, right? And if you word counted that, it's, I think I checked it before, it opened something like about 40 or 50 files. Most of those are just locale definitions being parsed and whatnot. But depending on how your environment was built, here's the answer. I mean, I asked how many files get opened and it's at least yeah, 32, okay? Now, uh, somebody in the front said S trace dash F to, 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 of course you wanna, get, you wanna make sure that you take in consideration any child processes and whatnot. The, the number would just grow. Okay, that's files. Now we'll talk about why that's interesting or not in a moment, but what about environment variables? Can I just use strace to figure out what environment variables get set? Get E and V and set E and V are not system calls. So they end up just reading the environment block out of the process's address space. So there's no get E and V that you can search for here, but what can we do to see what get E and V is actually how many times it's being called. Make an LD preload library that overrides Getty and V and set that and then print out some information. That's too much work for a 45 minute talk. We can just do this, we just GDB it, right? So we'll put a breakpoint on Getty and V and we'll just run it. So how many, do you th how many environment variables do you think will be will be queried. We didn't ask that. It depends. <laughs> Let's take a look. Well, the, down at the bottom you see loc path. That's the first thing that gets queried. I'm not quite sure what's querying that, but you can keep continuing this. LC all, blah, 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 blah. Lots of things, lots of locale related stuff. But eventually you get to a point where you're out of the library initialization part and you're here. Now this looks like some kind of built-in Getty and V. Uh, how do you print the argument? Arguments in the red, which register holds first argument? Ah, I gotcha. <laughs> the answer is? What's my favorite answer? Depends, I didn't give you enough information. Depends on the architecture. RDI is correct on AMD 64, x86, 64. This is an ARM laptop. What is it on ARM? R0, X0, whatever it is. I think it's X0. Term info. Home. Home again. I, would you read it twice? Because maybe it changed in half a millisecond. Okay, you get the idea, right? Lots of them. We could sit here all day watching this. It goes on for hundreds and hundreds of things. The more important thing is not, hey, here's what, here's what environment variables are being read. The more important thing is what's going on in the application when they're being read. 
Does anyone remember? Actually, it's coming up here on a couple more slides. Uh, does anyone remember Looney Tunables? Looney Tunables was a CVE from late last year, and it had to do with improper parsing of an environment variable, glibc tunables. So the fact that your application is reading this and using code to parse it that you've never written yourself is an indication that something is, something possibly could be bad. Okay, would you guys agree with the first statement? Any, any dissenters? Good. Most development organizations don't have the time to vet every piece of code that they, that they bring in, right? It's not possible, it just simply isn't. So this leads to these kind of behaviors that we're talking about. Now I've kind of given you for the past 15 minutes or so just an overview of application behavior in general and how you can monitor stuff. Now we'll actually look at some of the things, crazy things we've seen applications do. Sound good? All right. How many Java developers do we have out in the room? How many Java developers that don't want to admit to being Java developers? <laughs> I like it how people then raise their hand. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a recovering Java developer. <laughs> done Java development in the past. Um, anyone know what JNI is? The Java native interface. It's how you call C, basically C and C++ code from Java. Um, it allows you to call, call and pass parameters back and forth to different functions. There is a common redacted names protected, uh, names changed to protect the guilty. Uh, JNI based tracing framework out there, real super popular. It writes .so files, which are again, you know, shared library code to slash temp. It then loads them with DL, the JVM then loads them with DL open, which is what you do to get an SO into memory uh, when you call the Java side of the framework. Sounds okay, right? Until you have this. Now, can anybody see the problem with this? <laughs> You're creating executable code in temp with mode 777 with a predictable name. What could go wrong, right? Well, if you can simply guess the next name, it's 777, you can surreptitiously place a malicious piece of code in front of the thing that's creating the legitimate code, and ta-da, you've now commandeered, potentially commandeered control flow of the application. So, oops. You'll see a lot of 777 today. It seems to be everyone's favorite number. And again, it's not a Vegas thing. Okay, so I, again, I hope it's obvious why that's bad. Um, the more important thing, again, to reason, and this is what I was talking about earlier, I hope everyone takes away from this that the developer probably had no idea this is happening, right? It, it's just, hey, I use this framework, and it created a library and invoked some code in it. Okay, example two. Speaking of creating files with mode 777, again, it seems to be a popular mode. We see log files being created with mode 777 all the time because everybody loves executable logs, right? Right? Now, Again, as a developer, I'm probably not even aware this is happening. As a developer, I'm probably saying, you know, log dot message something, something, something. Um, I, I don't pay attention to these kinds of things. Making this even more risky is the propensity that many logging frameworks don't do proper parsing. Log with a parameter, they just simply write whatever parameter you specified into the logs. So what could you do with something like this? So a, a kind of a contrived example is something like this. Um, consider an application that logs some, you know, user provided input, you know, user foo logged in. So you get a log message that looks like this. Now, what, what would, what could happen if username was not, or if the, if the string in here was not properly parsed by the logging framework? I mean, in theory, I could do like something like that's my name. My username is that. Now, granted, you probably have to find a way to somehow execute that, but the, there's a lot of different things you could do with this, right? I mean, now you, have an, now you have an opportunity for somebody who's controlling one part of an application, writing data into a log file that could then possibly be executed by something else that was commandeered from some other, from some other vector. Okay, so executable logs. I mean, those are great, right? Everyone loves executable logs. Bet you guys have never heard of executable JSON or executable markdown. This is actually a screen capture from, uh, from our product when it found some things that were being added. Now again, I don't want to pick on permissions here because it's, we've already talked about it, but 
the permission ser- errors there, they might be innocuous, but it indicates one of a couple things. It's either lazy coding or maybe a wrong UMask setting or something similar. Now, these are usually created, again, with mode 777. So back to rewinding one slide. If I have a piece of an application that's writing like a JSON configuration file with mode 777, what does this mean for something else on the machine? If I commandeer a different component, I can now affect the configuration of a different thing on the system, right? So just, I don't understand why, I don't understand why this happens, but it does. So why tempt fate? Fix it. So back to environment variables again for just a, just a moment. Um, we've already seen that environment variables are queried more often than you might think. Um, some could be dangerous. Again, uh, glibc tunables is one example. Uh, anyone ever use less open and less close? Anyone even know that such environment variables exist? Yeah, less open and less close. I don't know if they're in all versions of less, but older versions of less used to look at this environment variable. And if it was set, when you did less on a file, it would actually run the command in less open first. So if you could drop that in somebody's environment, then you have control over any time they run less, they get to run another thing of your choice. Um, even if you don't use these environment variables, and you probably don't make direct reference to these, um, code that you imported might do this, or system level things. Uh, one thing we see often in, in looking at applications that are out there with our product is uh, lots of debug environment variables set and lots of secrets and keys and passwords in environment variables. How many people have ever been guilty of putting a password in an environment variable <laughs> and don't want to admit it? <laughs> yeah, we see it a lot. I mean, th this is why vaults exist, right? Now, you may say, well, you know, if I set it in an environment variable, it's only readable by that process, right? Anyone know the answer to that last question? What is the security boundary for an environment variable on a machine? Oops, get out of that one. Oh, sorry. You guys see that? Okay, I'm right now a uh, PID 366. And that is my shell right here. You guys know that you can read environment variables cross processes as long as you're the same user, right? A lot of nods, some shaking their heads. So yes, you can. The fact that I own process, I don't know, 401 here, I can go into proc 401 environ and I can read its environment. Now that's not, that's not a, a, a new revelation. That's been like that forever. But people tend to think that, oh, if I put something in an environment variable, it's secret. It's not. You can generally read cross, uh, cross things, right? Okay. Talk about that. Here's a good one. What do we think? <laughs> All right, I'll give you some hint. It shouldn't, but can it? The answer to this one is not really it depends. I mean, I suppose it kind of is it depends, but it, it definitely can happen. How? Well, we did see an environment where we've had auditing libraries that were left enabled, and they were set with you know, LD audit or LD preload set to pointing to some particular library that had library initialization code in it. Library initialization code that actually did a network connection. Um, so when you have that set, bin cat effectively made an outbound network connection every single time it ran. It's worse than that because it was set system wide, every process made an outbound network connection to do phone home. Sounds bad, right? It gets worse. <laughs> what is this phone home, op phone home operation doing? Well, th the way this thing was built is that it did an HTTPS connection and then used uh, like a, a JSON parser with REST to post a request to some update server to see whether or not there was a new version of the software available. So what does this mean? This means you have a library that's now injected into every process in the system which contains open SSL, a JSON parser, and an HTTPS 
and a TLS um, mechanism. And that's really good, right? Because we know that none of those things ever have bugs, right? Yeah. So again, case in point, developer had no idea this was, this was happening. So you have code that just simply gets injected and does random stuff. Speaking of phone home connections, in our internal testing, we found a popular dashboarding product that makes phone home connections probably again to do update checks again once a second. Because you really need to know within one second if there's a new version of the framework available, right? Um, it also does this check to every single IP address returned from the DNS query. So it does DNS lookup on myupdateserver.foo.com. It gets back 20 things, including half of them IPv4, half of them IPv6, and it tries every single one, once every second. Now, typically like a WAF or something can help stop that, but that's just bad behavior, right? Um, the other problem with this particular framework is that if you looked inside the code, because it's open source, looked to see what it was doing, it basically just blindly trusted a URL that was given to it and says, go download this and install it. Can anyone think of, well, I guess very recently, some code that got automatically installed and caused a lot of problems? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is uh, no, not good stuff. Um, speaking of network connections, um, our product lets us correlate uh, different network events over time. So basically we can say, like, um, I saw your product, I saw your code make an outbound network connection to IP address, you know, 1.2.3.4, but it previously had not obtained that through a DNS lookup. So basically what does that mean? It's, it's a hard coded IP address somewhere. Um, this helped us uncover an environment in some uh, a customer environment where there was a connection to code to a fixed IP address. Uh, coming from a dependency in the application, of course, developer did not do this. Does connecting to a hard coded IP indicate a security issue? I don't know, maybe it could be command and control from some hijacked library. Um, it could just be a lazy developer. I either way, it should be investigated. The point is, how do you even know it's happening, right? How about this one? Anyone ever guilty of doing SRAND1 or SRAND0 or SRAND time? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, we see this being called all the time. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with these APIs except if they're called in certain contexts. So the question at the bottom of the slide is, is asking, when is this kind of okay and when is this really bad? Anyone know the, the characteristics of the APIs that are listed on the top there? What was that? Uh, they're global, yeah. Um, but they're deterministic, right? So it's a deterministic random number API. So when is that okay? Uh, maybe test programs or something is probably fine. When is it bad? <laughs> Any cryptography context. And we, we see this on occasion. Um, it's not good. Um, but yeah, it's like, where did you come up with this code, right? So you either were reading a textbook from the 1970s or 80s when this was like the only way to do it, uh, or it was, we went to Stack Overflow and said, how do I generate a random number, right? <laughs> Cut and paste it into your code. Um, ancient functions like this uh, that have better versions are, um, are still being used. So we talked about RAND and SRAND, um, no bounds check, string manipulation operations, we see these all the time. A lot of this is in legacy code. It's getting better, um, but why? There are better versions of all these things available, so you should use them. And I'm not saying you should use them. I'm saying the people writing the dependencies that you're bringing in should use them. So why not spend a few hours and clean up this code? Okay, almost done. So what are some of the reasons why this happens? And this is just kind of you know my own personal opinion here. I think we see these issues for several reasons. Um, increasing use of third-party libraries. I mean, w nobody writes every single line of code in their, in their app. And the, um, like it or not, the, the rate, the, the velocity at which software is developed today lends itself very well to going to GitHub and finding the library that you need. Um, it, there's just nothing you can do to change that. Um, lack of time for developers and security teams to properly do proper vetting. Another issue is when, when you, if, Let's say you had infinite time and your security team and your development team said, uh, your development manager said, I want you to go and personally inspect all 50,000 lines of code you're importing. Are you going to always have that same 50,000 lines? 
what happens when version two of that library is released next week, right? You're gonna have to go do the same thing again. So there's just a lack of time. Time is money and you can't even conclusively do this. So you, you transitive dependencies, dependencies that bring in other dependencies and so on. Um, it's just, it's really difficult. And then lack of knowledge by some developers just even about security risks. I mean, that's kind of why we're all here, right? Um, junior developers sometimes aren't trained in this mindset. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough. Now, I have some ideas on how to fix these, but again, they're just my own personal ideas. Here's some suggestions. Um, strive for thinness whenever you can. Um, choose distributions that, if you're, on a, if you're building software for Linux, choose distributions that have uh, thinness as a mindset. Um, Alpine's a really good one, right? They, they strive for very, very thin software. Um, don't link in all the things just because you can. Um, don't don't say I might need smart card logins in my app someday, so I'm going to link the smart card li library. And you don't do it until you absolutely need it. Uh, use tools to periodically audit process behavior and APIs that are being used. Um, the only way to know what's happening is to actually look and see. So we just touched on some ideas today. I mean, there's commercial tools like what we offer, but there's other open source tools out there as well to help you check these things. Um, compare behaviors. Compare current behaviors to previous behaviors. Look for drift. Make sure things aren't changing without your knowledge. And uh, coach, you know, coach junior developers about the importance of this. Um, you know, there's no shame in, in, in saying, you know, we shouldn't be doing it this way. We should be doing it that way. And I guess, you know, try as best as you can to, to vet imported code. And then short of that, I think you have to write everything yourself, which is not really going to work. All right. So that's what I had. Um, we've got some time. Um, I can give everyone back their 15 minutes, and if you have some questions, come on up at the end. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're right outside at our at our booth if you have any questions about what we do or want to talk about this more. Hope this was entertaining and interesting. Um, I find it, I found it writing these things down over time helped me understand what apps are doing a little bit better. So hope it did for you as well. Thanks. Thank you. If you have a question, please raise your hand so I can bring the mic over so everyone can hear. Hey, Soundcheck. All right, this is really good stuff. Thank you. So in, in my position, I mean, we have like an EDR application that we use that flags a lot of this stuff for us, right? Like unpacking a encrypted binary or a weird network connection or stuff like that, right? But sometimes it's a five minute fix. Like I can ask somebody and they say, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Or, oh, that's this thing, right? But right. sometimes it's just a, a legacy development team in another part of the country that has no idea what they've inherited from five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. And they just say, I don't know, but I don't want to worry about that. I don't have time. So we have to make a call of, do I really care enough to do like a deep dive investigation into 30,000 lines of C code to find where this is coming from? Or do I just block it or ignore it? Right. Cause it's from, probably from, not from 10 years ago. It, exactly. <laughs> right. So uh, I guess, what words of wisdom do you have about when do you make the call about when something is worth looking into and when do you just slap the firewall, turn it off and say, all right, we're going to forget about it. You're going to love my answer. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, a, a one-stop shop answer for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really does depend on the application, it depends on the criticalness of, is it a critical line of business a piece of functionality in your line of business or is it just this, you know, tool that's off on the side somewhere? Um, I, I I don't want to kind of dodge around the question, but they're really, it's, it's tough. And as, as you've already seen, yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I did have an answer. Um, no, nah, it's, it's, it's a case by case basis, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wish I got paid to look at this stuff, right? Like yeah. that, that's the fun part of the yeah. job, right? Just finding this stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting when you, when you bring up an application, a lot of this stuff we find just like testing open source products. It's just like, what are they doing? Right. It's like, what is going on here? So a yeah, great question. Yeah. Cool. Looks like that's it. Uh, I'm happy to hang around up here in the front if you want to ask a personal question or something that's off camera. No worries. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>